All right, so let's finish up here and talk about one more section real quick called Deceptive Trade Practices with the Consumer Protection Act. So there are definite definitions of what is considered unfair trade practice. It describes the use of deceptive, fraudulent, or unethical methods to gain a business advantage or cause injury to a consumer in the pra daily practice. Unfair trade practices are considered unlawful, <laughs> duh, <laughs> in the Consumer Protection Act. So what are some of the rationale? There are market guarantees. That would be an illegal trade practice, making illegal comments about guaranteeing profits. Hey, buy this house, we'll resell it, I guarantee a profit. That is an illegal or an unfair trade practice. Unfair advertising. False advertising includes the misrepresentation of a product defined to give an unfair uh, in, insight to the property. <clears throat> and I'm thinking of one that's not real estate, but I know that there is one, a company that is continually going out of business. That is actually considered if they are always has the sign that says always going out of business that is a deceptive trade practice all right you cannot give misleading information or false advertisement about that we in the real estate world would call that a blind ad you cannot give a blind ad i know that i have seen builders do this where they put a picture of a house and then they say for sale and you call and they say, well, that's really the model. We're selling this new build that's just now coming out of the ground. That's actually a deceptive practice. All right. Because they're not really showing you what they're selling. That is a, that is a misleading advertisement. If you target a specific vulnerable market, like the elderly with a deceptive or people that maybe have language barriers that could be a deceptive trade practice misrepresenting a service bing 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 single versus dual agency that is actually a deceptive trade practice you didn't disclose to both parties that you represent the other side that is unfair. That's why we have the form that requires us in Indiana and every other state that allows it that has to be signed because if you don't, you are misrepresenting to one party or the other that, hey, I represent the other party. You cannot give misleading information. This is one that you will see all the time. And I get you guys, I've had four of you in this class actually call me about this. When the other agent says, well, we already have an offer. Dude, I know what you're saying. It's hard to, hard to prove, but if you could prove it, that's actually a violation of the Consumer Protection Act. That is a deceptive trade practice to gain an unfair advantage in make by making that other buyer oh i gotta kick my offer up we see this all the time there was an agent and i'm not going to mention their name several years ago that represented a lot of bank owned properties now market was different so don't laugh some of you newer agents may laugh at this this property was on the market for 360 days one year vir virtually i called them with an offer for my client and literally within the first 30 seconds, he told me, we have another offer. Is this the best you could do? Now, was he lying? Dude, I am a betting man and I would have bet a lot of money that yes, he was lying. And I literally called him out on it. I'm like, really? Do you expect me to believe that this house that has been on the market a year, all of a sudden got an offer within the last 20 minutes of my offer? And he's like, well, yeah, uh, okay. <clears throat> my client chose to not increase their offer and lo and behold, my client won the bid. And I'm using won the bid and finger quotes for you sitting at home. You guys are getting a laugh out of this because my belief was the dude was friggin' lying. 
that is a misleading, deceptive practice. Do not do that. Don't tell another agent, oh, we've got an offer. I know actually an agent that asked for highest and best with another buyer and they were the only offer. I know that because the agent told me. It was not one of my agents, but the other agents are like, oh, dude, you should have seen what I did the other day. Now this guy wrote an offer and we sent back, we want the highest and best. And I said something to him, isn't that deceptive? And he's like, well, no, I can ask for highest and best. I'm like, no, you inferred that you had another offer and inferred this. That would have been probably construed by a court of law as a deceptive trade practice because he inferred that the buyer should raise their offer because they claimed they wanted their highest and best, which is used when there is multiple offers on the table. Could he have wiggled out of that by, oh, I can always ask for more money. Yeah, I get that but not in the method that you use the terms highest and best that inferred that there was another offer on the table. <clears throat> Failing to disclose pertinent information, you have to disclose facts that would reasonably influence the consumer's decision to make a purchase. Don't lie. If you know the foundation's cracked and it's a $10,000 damage as a listing agent, but you don't disclose that, that's a violation of the disclosure rules that could violate our code of ethics, but it also considered a deceptive trade practice, which could be a legal issue because you have not given the full information and allowed the buyer to make a true offer based on full knowledge. So make sure. The Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, is the largest federal agency that handles consumer complaints, including unfair and deceptive trade practice. Every state has some version of the consumer protection law, which prohibits any of these deceptive practices. All right? Most statutes commonly, and they commonly call these the Unfair and Deceptive Act, provide a bedrock of foundational requirements that you have to follow if you are dealing with consumers. And I have listed up on the screen, there are several that I've pulled out. For instance, in Indiana, a person who disseminates false, misleading, or deceptive advertisements commits a deception pursuant to section blah, 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 which is a class A misdemeanor. Texas has uh, same rules and they can actually include temporary restraining honor orders on the person that did the deceptive practice and can issue an injunction on your practice and they have penalties up to $20,000. Ohio virtually has the same rule as Texas, where they can impose penalties upon you financially. And we're not even talking about the NAR. The NAR could get a hold of you and, you, and violate one of the code of ethics rules. And you could potentially have your license suspended or revoked but this is a natural state law. There are other consumer protection acts that we deal with. We, the anti-spam, the Fair and Accurate Credit, Credit Transaction Act, the FCA, the Credit Reporting Act, the Debt Collection Practices, those people who we all think are probably unethical, probably is not true. They have rules they have to abide by. TILA, the Truth and Lending Act, is a Consumer Protection Act. So those are there. Now, if a consumer feels like that you have provided deceptive trade practices or unethical, they can actually file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission or the State Attorney General. Most states, Indiana included, can actually file an injunction to stop your practice as well as, like I said, then you could be liable for NAR situations. And if they 
file an injunction for you to stop practice, that could be very detrimental because not only are you going to not be able to broker anymore, you can actually get penalized by the state from anywhere, depending on five grand up to 25 grand on each account that they get you for deceptive trade practice. A person who has been aggrieved and files against a company, including a real estate brokerage, can actually get treble damages, which is triple for you lay people, plus the court cost and reasonable attorney fees. So if you are doing this to earn five or six or 10 grand, they can sue for 20 grand. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't even do math. They could sue for up to 30 grand three times. That does not fall into the injunction penalty by the state. So that consumer can sue you and the state may penalize you or fine you. So in theory, the consumer can fine you three times the damages. So you're going to pay up the 30 grand plus their court costs, plus attorney. And then the state may come along later and fine you 25 grand. And then the NAR may suspend your license. So please be real careful when you get the urge to tell somebody, hey, we already have an offer. If you don't, because I know it would be hard, but if it could be proven, you could be in a series of world of hurt. All right. So I want to end this with any questions. If you have any questions or comments, and you want to get a hold of me, feel free to email me, Raymond at realuniversity.com. Call the office. If you've got my private number, call me. We can talk a little bit about it. I want to thank you very much for coming here and talking about agency. And I hope everybody has a successful career. See you later. Bye.